Hello, and welcome to episode two of Pax Americana, a conversation about world affairs and global conflict, hosted by me, Michael Shurkin. Today, what I want to talk about is Iran. Uh, I don't want to bury the lead here. I have of late become an Iran hawk. This, this does not mean that my view of Iran has changed. Rather, my view of what to do about Iran has changed. Uh, and, and this is sort of, unfortunately, with great reluctance, but, but here we are. Um, my view of Iran is really very simple. And, and I want to talk about this first. Right. First of all, I see Iran as at the root of a lot of the problems that we're having in the Middle East. It's, it's Iran. It's all about Iran. It's always been about Iran or at least since the Islamic Revolution in 1978. Thus, it's difficult to imagine how things could really get better unless Iran were to change course, either through its own volition or because it's forced to. But as long as Iran does what Iran does, and Iran is what Iran is, it's going to remain a mess. Second, my understanding of Iran is as follows. Iran is one of those countries that's defined by resentment, right? Now, think about it this way. Countries usually, nations, I should say, nations have usually have a positive identity, meaning that they define themselves based on themselves, who they are, without reference to some other, right? It's all about their own subjectivity, but it's also all about them, right? I am uh, Korean. I speak Korean. I have a Korean culture that I'm very proud of. I have Korean cuisine and and uh, I'm Korean, right? This is a positive definition. Uh, Iran is one of those countries though where their resentment, their, their relationship, where their identity is less a positive one about who they are, which they easily could be given the richness of Iranian culture and Iranian heritage and Iranian cuisine is phenomenal, right? It's an amazing country. It's an amazing country with an amazing culture, amazing history, et cetera, et cetera. But at sort of a, the, the national identity as it's constructed itself, as it appears, at least since 1978, is a negative one that is done vis-a-vis -vis the other and in reference to the other and driven by resentment towards the other. A, a great example or counterexample that I could point to is Vietnam. Vietnam is uh, a country that has every reason to be resentful and to hold grudges. They have every reason to be to hate French people and to hate American people, uh, to hate Chinese people, to hate Japanese people. Think of all the terrible things that have been done to them. But do they? Right? It is my understanding that the Vietnamese people basically don't care. Or rather, you know, yeah, they know about their history or whatever, but, but it doesn't define them. That's not who they are. They're not interested. They're not, they don't invest energy, like negative energy, into that part of their history, that part of their identity. Rather, their focus is on moving forward and building their country and making factories and developing their economy and, and, and advancing their own interests, their own national interests and their own interests as a people, uh, not out of their own interests like any other country does, right? But it's not about resentment. It's not about grudges. It's not motivating them. Now, I don't think Iran is the only country that is motivated for which resentment plays such a powerful role. I think Turkey is another country like this. I mean, there's something that was made home, brought home to me when uh, over a decade ago I had the pleasure of going to the uh, Ataturk Mausoleum in, in Ankara. It's a phenomenal place. I mean, Ankara is a lovely city. Uh, the, if you go, absolutely go to the Ataturk Museum. It is absolutely fascinating. But in its portrayal of Turkish history, modern Turkish history, one of the things that I really perceived and felt to a degree that I didn't really understand prior was the extent to which, from a certain Turkish point of view, they were gang raped by the West at the end of World War One and the years following World War One, Gang raped. And that gang rape still figures in how they think about their relationship with the West. And there's still this resentment that, that's there. Uh, I think Russia also arguably f has this resentment towards the West, and this, this is definitely shaping the Russian worldview and shaping Russian policy, etc. Third, when it comes to Iran, this resentment combines with religious fundamentalism, religious and arguably racial bigotry to shape 
Iranian, Iranian foreign policy, policy far more than the kind of rational realpolitik, the rational calculation of interests that we normally understand or that we assume, right? We think of countries doing like what Vietnam does, where the Vietnamese, they're very smart, the Vietnamese think in terms of rationally their countries, their people's interests, right? And it doesn't appear to me, at least, to be motivated by irrational things like resentment, grudges, uh, some kind of mysticism, some kind of religious thing, whatever. No, it's very rational. And as a result, it's actually something that we can understand, right? I think that's a real advantage, right? We, we get the Vietnamese, at least at that level. The Iranians, no. It's, it's, there's this resentment and religious bigotry, religious fundamentalism, and racism. There's really no other way to explain their antipathy towards Israel. Israel has no beef with Iran. Iran has no natural beef with Israel. Like, and, you know, some countries in there invariably have points of dispute. Territory, for example, you could see, you know, if you ever, when you, if you play the game of diplomacy, you kind of get it that like, you know, Russia and the Austrian Empire are going to come to blows over certain areas, land that's sort of between them, and there's a worried about influence. That's not really relevant for Iran and Israel, and their natural allies are the same, their natural enemies are the same. Before the Islamic Revolution, Iran under the Shah and Israel got along very well. The relations were at the very least cordial. There's no problem between the two countries, and Israel doesn't have any demands on, on Iran. There's no territorial or anything like that. That's not that kind of conflict. Rather, Iran has a beef with Israel. Iran's beef with Israel is that it exists. Iran's beef with Israel is religious, it's bigotry, right? Which is part of why it drives me crazy when people treat Iran and Israel as like, oh, you know, these are just two countries that, that just to have a dispute, like France and Germany in the 19th century. No, one side just kind of wants to be left alone. The other side is a bigot, right? And the other side's beef with the one side is just that it exists and because they, they, they it, it just, it, it's racism, right? So that I think is something really that's, that's essential to understand and, and why also part of why I think the Americans, uh, I think have generally have misunderstood Iran and continue to misunderstand Iran. So let's, let's then focus on this question of U.S. relations with, with Iran. How have we handled the challenge of Iran since the Islamic Revolution? And in one word, badly. Two words, really badly. At the time of the revolution of 1978, and I, I've, I've really read deeply into this to try to understand how we understood it. Now, I'm old enough to remember this. I was a kid then, I was in elementary school, but the news were there, like, because every night at dinner, uh, my family, we would watch uh, CBS News, Dan Rather, I believe, so Walter Conkright, I'm pretty sure it's Dan Rather, he'd get on and he'd say, you know, today, today's uh, day 232 uh, of the hostage crisis, blah, blah, blah. And it was very depressing. It was very dour. Dan Rather was very dour. The mood was very dour. Jimmy Carter was very dour. And a lot of it had to do with Iran. And I remember this, right? And I remember seeing the covers on Times and Newsweek, Time, Time or Newsweek. I don't remember which my parents subscribed to, but it was one of them. And then all the headlines. It was, it was present, and I could feel it even as a kid. It is my understanding that the U.S. never had any understanding whatsoever of the Islamic Revolution. Fundamentally didn't get it. Because fundamentally don't get religion as a driver. Fundamentally do not get, certainly, the kind of religion that we're dealing with in Iran, right? That the, the particular take of Shia Islam I mean, there's so many things that you need to understand. Like, first of all, religion as a driver, sort of a, as a sociological, political phenomenon. And then Shia Islam as a sociological, political phenomenon. And then we have to add to this, this other level of complexity of Khomeini's particular take on Shia Islam as a social political driver, right? It's all very complicated. And we don't have a clue. We don't understand any of this. What do we understand? Well, being monomaniacal Americans, we look at all this through the lens of the Cold War. And all that really matters is what does this mean for the Cold War, which is this bipolar world between us and the Soviets. And all we're afraid of is whether or not Iran was going to fall into the Soviet orbit, right? Become a Soviet satellite. This Islamic thing happening in 78 that percolates and then explodes is 
something we view as a, a passing storm, right? It's a passing cloud. And it's going to pass. So we're worried about what comes afterwards. And our nightmare scenario, again, because we don't understand what we're dealing with. Like, we don't understand that this passing cloud is not a passing cloud. It's this huge storm front that's moving in, or rather it's this climactic transition. That's the nightmare scenario, but we don't get that. We think this is a passing cloud. And the nightmare scenario for us is that this is followed by a uh, the, the rise of the Iranian Communist Party and that Iran becomes a Soviet satellite. That's what worries us. So when the hostage crisis kicks off in 79, this is why the Carter administration doesn't do a thing other than, you know, we're concerned, we have negotiations. There's that cluster of a rescue attempt that's just a total fiasco and incredibly embarrassing. And again, I remember the, the covers from Time or Newsweek, and I remember which we had when I was a kid. I mean, it was, it was devastating. And I, I recall looking at all the pictures. I don't think I read the text, but I was looking at all the pictures. And I was very upset in my own way. Um, but we didn't do anything. And I never really understood it. And there was this feeling of impotence that I think really bothered people. And this also partly explains why Carter was defeated so soundly by Reagan this feeling of impotence, this feeling of frustration, the fact that we were just kind of floundering, what did we do? And even as a kid, I never understood why we didn't simply threaten the Iranians, because God knows we had the military power. It should be very simple. You've got 72 hours. Those hostages need to be on the tarmac in Geneva in 72 hours. Are we going to start destroying your cities? Or are we going to start destroying your oil terminals? We're going to start destroying your economy. We're going to look, drop every bridge in your country. We're going to, whatever, doesn't matter. But we could do it. Why didn't we? The answer, again, is because the Carter administration fundamentally did not understand the Islamic Revolution, did not understand that it was the real deal, that this was the threat, saw it as a pass, passing storm, and thought that the real threat was the country falling into the Soviet orbit and it was afraid that either this, the, the, the Iranian communists would take over or that if we're too harsh against this new Islamic regime, which we didn't think was going to last anyways, they would turn to the Soviets. So let's not go there. Let's not try to bully them. That was Carter's response. Then Reagan takes over. And you think that Reagan, right, because of all of his chest beating and his posturing, and this tough talk would change things, but the reality is no, right? There's a message here because like Reagan, Carter was dour, people disliked him. Reagan was upbeat and talk tough, but more often than not, Reagan's policies were identical to Carter's, but people liked it and people don't really get it anyways. And even today, a lot of people are like, oh, Reagan was the greatest, the greatest, blah, blah, blah. But I think half of it is bullshit. So as a result, I think that Carter is badly underrated and Ronald Reagan is badly overrated. That being said, what happens? 1983, they blow up our embassy in Beirut. What did we do? Nothing. Also in 1983, they blow up our marine barracks. They kill 241 of our soldiers. Marines, I guess I should say. They also bomb the French army barracks and they kill 58 French soldiers. From what I read, and I think it was at this moment that, you know, the French were pissed, we were pissed. We planned together a joint airstrike. We were going to bomb Iranian camps that were in the Beka Valley of Lebanon. And the French aircraft were already in the air, and Reagan chickened out and called it off. And Mitterrand was absolutely furious. Remember that, right, when there's all this talk about, like, the, you know, the French being the surrender monkeys and, you know, we're the tough guys or the Ronald Reagan's the tough guys. No, Mitterrand was, 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 one to bomb, and it was Reagan who chickened out. Think about that. But we don't do anything. They bomb our embassy again, 1984, embassy annex, same thing. All through the 1980s, the Iranians take American diplomats and other Western diplomats hostage in Beirut. What do we do? Nothing. Actually, no, we come up with a completely bonkers, convoluted scheme to try to encourage Iranian moderates by selling Iran weapons, which we do, including a lot of um, tow missiles, anti-tank missiles, a lot of which, as far as I understand, ended up in southern Lebanon were used with devastating effect against Israeli armor uh, in the 1980s, 1990s. Otherwise, we don't do anything. Later, 
I mean, Lebanon kind of quiets down. I mean, Hezbollah is Hezbollah, right? We all know about that. But I also want to point to the fact that the, Isra that the uh, Iranians bombed the Israeli embassy in Buenos Aires, killing 29 people in 1992. And then 1994, the Iranians blow up the Jewish community center in Buenos Aires, known as Amia, killing 87 people. Think about that. What is Amia? It's a JCC, right? Like we have in all the towns, all the larger cities I've been in in the United States. It's a big JCC, right? What goes on in JCC? Uh, there's usually a theater, there are performances, uh, there are art shows, there are often kindergartens, daycares, there's a gym, social events, right? People use this space to do social things. It's very nice. It's a community, right? They bomb it in Buenos Aires. Just think about that. What is that? Is this realpolitik? No, this is racism. This is religious bigotry. This is resentment. This is not normal, right? And I don't think we should normalize this but we have right because everybody sort of seems that this is kind of normal in light of i don't know the arab israeli conflict no it's nothing to do with the arab israeli conflict this is about iranian racism anyways what does the world do about the army bombing absolutely nothing absolutely nothing now let's fast forward to september 11th september 11th happens september 11th 2001 happens there is a moment of sort of like an opening for a detente with Iran because Iran signals a willingness to cooperate with the United States vis-a-vis -vis the Taliban and vis-a-vis Al-Qaeda. And people, when they speak about this, usually are critical of George W. Bush because what George W. Bush did was he spurned this opening on the part of the Iranians uh, with his uh, axis of evil speech. Right, which threw out the entire possibility that maybe there's this opening with the Iranians. That might be true, right? That, but let's set that aside. I think the critical part for understanding, for me, the takeaway of September 11th, where the Iranian response to September 11th is that they were scared. They were scared. They were afraid that we were going to go after them in part because our ostensible concern, right, we clearly were worried about the nexus of international terrorism and nuclear weapons. They're up to their necks in both. So they're scared. That's why they suddenly signal, you know, they're going to be amicable. That's very important for understanding. They are amicable, willing to cooperate because they're scared. Anyways, nothing much happens, and we do the worst possible thing, which is that we went and we invaded Afghanistan and Iraq, both countries neighbor Iran. We take out a government that is a counterweight to Iran, which makes things worse, and we place large numbers of American soldiers and American allies in proximity to Iran, and within the range of Iran's easy ability to do serious harm. What I mean by that is uh, material support to the people who are killing Americans and allies in Iran and Afghanistan. So for instance, in Afghanistan, uh, Iran and, uh, and Taliban, not friends. However, they have relations. And one thing that Iran would do from time to time is they would supply certain weapons to the Taliban, which we could trace, and we can understand that this is proof of the tie between the two countries. The two things in, that I'm thinking of are man pads, right, so uh, ground air missiles, and a type of IED called EFP, or electrically formed projectile, I think that's what it's called, which is a particularly deadly form of, of uh, IED. It's like a mine that you put on the side of a road, and it's particularly effective against armor because it could punch through the heaviest armor, right? So it's sort of like a, uh, it's an evolution of a shape charge. They would pop up in Iraq and Afghanistan, mostly traced to Iran. They would pop up in Afghanistan, thank God not often. There weren't a lot of EFPs in Afghanistan, there weren't a lot of man pads, but everyone in Somalia would pop up. And usually when they would pop up, they were traceable to Iran. And what it made clear was that Iran had the ability at will to dial up this material support to the Taliban or to various other armed groups in Iraq or dial it down. 
right? They could shed American blood very easily in large quantities if they wanted at will, right? This is seriously problematic. So that's what's going on in the 2000s. All this leads up to uh, the negotiations about the Iranian nuclear program, which results in the JCPOA agreement. JCPOA is a very complicated affair. Uh, I, at the time, was really on the fence about it. Um, for one thing, there were some very well-informed, knowledgeable people who wrote very strong critiques of JCPOA. And I wouldn't say they're ideologically motivated. It wasn't necessarily like we're Iran hawks. We don't like the idea of having peace with Iran. It's more like, you know, uh, if you look at the technical aspects of this agreement, there are some serious problems here, right? So these were sort of credible, rational, reasonable concerns. And they, they were real. They were legitimate. On the other hand, um, what were the alternatives, really? Like, what are we actually going to do about Iran, right? So it always struck me that JCPOA represented the least worst option because the other options are we do nothing about the nuclear program. That sounds like a really bad idea. Or what? We go to war. And the people who are rattling their sabers about Iran never seem to talk about that. They're like, we need to be tough, tough, tough. Like they bang the desk, like tough. We need to be tough on Iran. But what does that mean? What does that actually look like? And ultimately, it sounded like what they really wanted was war. But let's think about this. Let's think this through. Are they thinking it through? Or maybe they thought it through, but they didn't want to do it out loud. I don't really know. But it, I was very uncomfortable with this kind of talk, this tough talk. What do we actually do? So it was a problem. So, so at any rate, that's why ultimately I thought that JCPOA represented the least worst option and thought it's better than nothing. The Trump administration threw it out. And we place it with this tough talk about maximum pressure, which always seemed very vague. What does this actually mean? And not only that, but maximum pressure is problematic given that it's not clear that sanctions had any effect whatsoever. Secondly, sanctions regimes work best when you have the full support of the rest of the international community. We had that full support for the JCPOA. Right? The French, the British, etc. were really on board with JCPOA, and they were also on board with the sanctions regimes that were in place at the time. They had some really tough talk about Iran. But by tearing up JCPOA, we burned some real goodwill there. And so that our maximum pressure after JCPOA was much more of a unilateral affair than it had been in the past, and certainly than it needs to be in order to be effective. So this is a problem. So again, you're left with the situation, well, what are we going to do? Now, Trump did do his credit kill Soleimani, but again, it's like that's one thing. But otherwise, what are we going to do? And it's a symbolic thing, and I guess it's useful, but, but ultimately it was a lot of tough talk without any real action. It's, it's felt like Ronald Reagan all over again. So what do we do now? So now we're in the situation where we've kind of let this go on for too long, right? I'm still convinced that if Jimmy Carter had basically said to the Iranians, we're going to blow the bejesus out of your oil industry or whatever if you don't give us your hostages. I think everything would be a lot better today. Right. But he didn't. And Ronald Reagan didn't and, and Clinton didn't and Obama didn't and and Trump didn't. So now we're we're, we're where we are and we've got uh there uh, Iran is holding a gun to Israel's head in Lebanon with Hezbollah. Hamas is a Iranian proxy You've got Iranian proxies causing all sorts of havoc in Iraq, and then you've got the Houthis causing traffic trouble with the, the Red Sea shipping, and it, it's a gigantic mess, and all of these things, like, you know, it's this network, and Iran's at the center of the network. So now what do we do? Now I am finding of the conviction that you got to do something because the present course of action doesn't work. Also, Biden's response is to, for instance, our, our servicemen, service people being killed by uh this um, drone strike by these Iranian proxies in Iraq, when we bomb them, we bomb proxies. We're not hurting Iranians themselves. And I think that's important to keep in mind because I don't believe the Iranians are concerned about the welfare of their Iraqi or their Houthi or their Palestinian proxies. They don't care, right? These are not humanitarians like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. No, they don't care. And that's part of the joy of using proxies because they're expendable. So that's stop killing the proxies and 
find ways to really hurt Iran, or at least credibly threaten Iran. And, and I think it's really overdue. And this might mean um, going after the, the oil industry, going after the oil terminals, which of course that's problematic because then the price of gas goes up and then all these people are angry at Biden because of the cost of price go gas going up and they need it to fill up their pickup trucks and now they're gonna vote for Trump. That's an issue. Um, I, I, all the possible, there, there's a very long list of possible targets, all of which have pros and cons, all of which should, should be debated. But I think that's the debate that we need to be having. And I think ultimately, or it needs to be happening somewhere. And ultimately, we need to stop pussyfooting around because it hasn't gotten us anywhere. And we need to go back to the place we were in the aftermath, in the wake of September 11th, when the Iranians were scared. The Iranians need to be afraid of us. And at the moment, they're not. And I think that's a huge problem. And that's going to remain a, long, a problem for a very long time. Thank you very much. Uh, please uh, stay tuned or subscribe. If you like this, press like, hit like, subscribe. Uh, there's more uh, of these in the works, in the pipeline that will be coming out uh, in the weeks to come. Also, for those of you who are looking at the YouTube, please look at the links in the description for my Substack. Please look at my Substack. It goes under the name of Pax Americana. You can also find me on Twitter and LinkedIn. And I have a website, Michael Sherkin, one word, dot com. And thank you.